we're kind of in week two of this, this little series called Vital Series. I shouldn't say little. It's actually one of the longer series we do, I've ever done. But it's, uh, we're in this, this series of uh, just conversations around this idea of vital signs and what's it look like to, to just check in periodically on, on, on compartments of our life, pieces of our life that God has given us that we can measure our health and our vitality. How are we really doing uh, in a Jesus-shaped way, how are we doing uh, in our health and our view of ourselves, our view of God, relationship with God, rhythm with others, our thinking, all of those kind of things. And today we're going to look at just one, which we're starting, really starting the series with this because it's probably the foundational one. This is the one that will influence all of the other ones in some way. It'll show up every other time we check a vital sign. So you just kind of spiritually and in a rhythm with God, we're saying, okay, what's our oxygen level? How's our heart rate? What's the blood flow? What's, you know, what are all the blood tests? I mean, where are we really at with all of that? Uh, several years ago, my first job out of college was in a little town called Corning, New York. And uh, in Corning, New York, we became friends. Uh, I don't even remember how this happened, but we became friends uh, with a family who owned an ice cream shop in Corning, New York. And it was really good ice cream. It was really good. And there was one on the east side of town and one on the west side of town. You can go to each one. And uh, I became really good friends with a guy named Greg, who was the manager of these. And when I would go to this ice cream shop, uh, I, I was in a phase of my life at that point where I loved cookies and cream shakes. I, just, I mean, just bring them all. Let's, let's have all of them, right? I don't think I've had one in 20 years. But back then, man, it was like, let's have the cookies and cream shake. And so when I would go, like the cookies and cream shake was always good. But if Greg was there, Greg would make me the cookies and cream shake. And I learned they're not all created equal. Greg would do something to it, add a couple things, mix it in a different order, put some things multiple times back to the little blender deal. Like, it was this incredible deal. And sometimes Greg would want to show me, do you want to know what I'm doing now? Like, this is what I'm going to do now. And candidly, like, Greg was my friend, so I could be really honest. Candidly, I'm like, no, bro, I just want the shake. I don't care how you're developing the shake. Just give me the shake, right? I'm, here, I'm not here for a, a, a shake-making 101 lesson. I'm here to consume the shake, right? Bro, just give me the ice cream, Okay. And some of you, you have that kind of relationship with ice cream, right? I mean, just give me the ice cream, right? I got a friend who has ice cream every single night, like 365, doesn't matter where he is, 365 ice cream. And that's not quite me, right? But in that period, cookies and cream shake was the thing. I don't really care how it was developed and how it formed them. There are other experiences we have in life where we really do, like we love to see and understand how something is formed, Right? Uh, in, in kind of the broader journey family right now, uh, there are just all sorts of gals who are pregnant. I mean, it just feels like that they're, they're everywhere. If you turn around, oh, another, oh, no, I mean, it just, and it happens, right? Streaks and everything like this happens. And one thing that's fun is like when, when I interact with a, with a gal who's pregnant, it's always fun, like depending on where they're at in the pregnancy, and just say, hey, how's it going? Like, how are you? Are you healthy, baby healthy? Just how's everything going? But then just to hear them kind of light up and when they talk about, oh, we went to the doctor, like we recently went to the doctor, right? And you get to a certain point and you get these ultrasounds, and you, right? And you can, and every, it every, feels like every year, like somehow those improve and the technology, right? The, the beauty of modern medicine sometimes is great, right? When you kind of get to see, and they're getting to see like how the baby is developing, right? And it's fascinating and intriguing and it's really cool, right? It's like, oh, yeah. I mean, this is just a shake. It's just, a, it's just a, I mean, it's a cookies and cream shake, but it's just a shake. This, I mean, this is a life, and this is cool, and man, thank God for the beauty of modern medicine that we could actually wash it. There are some things that it's worth knowing, like, hey, how's the development going? I want to talk to you today about, about something that is, that it is present in your life. It is part of your life. The question is not, do I have this? The question really is, how has it been and how is it being developed? How has it been and how is it being developed? Because it is being developed in some way. And you can actually influence the influencers in your own development. What I want to talk about just a little bit is this, is this word that gets tossed around a lot. So we're going to like put some structure to it at least a little bit and then navigate it. It's this idea of, of your identity. You have an identity. You have an identity. I have an identity. You, you identify with, with, with certain things, or you have an identity that you, you see yourself through. In fact, just to see it, let's look at a couple definitions. First one, I just want to show you a theolog- uh, theologian, Timothy Keller, who's really just a, a brilliant guy, brilliant writer. He said this, identity is our sense of, of self, and it's our sense of worth. Like, what are we really worth, and what makes us worth that? It's our core trust and source of value, and it's our core source of recognition, when you know what's my identity, it's like, where do you find your recognition? It's whatever we look to is the ultimate source 
for our security, like what gives us some stability, and our, our worth, okay? Like that's broad identity. Where do I get my, my sense of worth and value and recognition? Like, and that, that points me to, oh, that's, that's my identity. That's what I find my identity in. Let's look at it, same but just slightly different, from a philosopher named Charles Taylor. This, this is what he said. Identity is defined by the commitments and the identifications which provide the frame or horizons in which I can try and determine from case to case what is good or valuable or what ought to be done or what I want to endorse or oppose. So on one hand, you have identity that your identity is, is where you find your worth. It's, it's what is established as your point of significance. And once that is, when, once that is in place, that identity influences how, what you will view as right or wrong, what you will endorse, what you will oppose, how you will respond to situations. All of that together points to us, oh, this is, this is my identity. This sense of worth, this sense of center, which results in what we endorse, oppose, think, and how we view things, how we view ourselves, how we view the world around us. That's this identity. And here's the thing about identity. You, you, you may not be sure what your identity is. You may have not thought about your identity. You may have thought a lot about your identity and have an idea of what it is. But, but here, here's the thing that we got to understand, and this will help us check the vital signs, is your identity has been formed by something. Really, your identity has been formed by some things, plural. Right? And it, it starts, really from, starts really from birth. But let's just talk about it a little bit. I want us to just see it in the story of God and humanity in the scriptures. That, again, that's always going to be our jumping off point, right? It's okay, what has God brought us to in the story of himself in the scriptures? If you've got a Bible or you want to unlock a device, I want you to see this. It's maybe a common story, familiar story to you. 1 Samuel chapter 16, but we're going to see it through a little different lens today. In 1 Samuel chapter 16, we're going to jump into the life of a guy named David. David becomes a phenomenal um, leader and king. He, he, at one point in his life, is a really good shepherd. He's an incredible warrior. Uh, he, he's a dad. He's a husband. Like, right? he, there's a, David's life is really full uh, we have more of David's life recorded in the scripture than re- probably any other person, and so you, you get lots of insight into David. And in 1 Samuel chapter 16, we're, we're fairly early on in the story of David, and one of the people we're going to encounter in the story is a guy named Saul. Saul's the priest of Israel at the time, which would have been the primary spiritual influence, and that day God would speak through the priest, that the, the priest would first hear from God, he would convey these messages, and he, he would anoint and kind of approve God's, he would express God's plan, then anoint people and leaders and all that kind of stuff. And we're really jumping in to a time where, 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 where Saul's looking, or Samuel, sorry, Samuel is looking like, okay, God, who's the next king? Because there's a guy named Saul. Saul's been the king, and Saul's just gone off the rails. Uh, Saul started good, but he, it, it's, just, it's not good. And so he's pushed away God, kind of rejected God, and kind of gotten caught in his own paranoia and fear and, and narcissism. And so Samuel, the priest, is, is on the scene, and he's going to help appoint God's next anointed. Let's pick it up. This, we'll just kind of read through this story. said this, the Lord said to Samuel, how long are you going to mourn Saul? Like, yes, he was the king, but how long are you going to mourn this since I have rejected him as king over Israel? And rejected simply means I just can't bless him anymore. Like, he's just putting himself, I just can't bless that. Like, it just, he's outside my hand of protection and blessing. Fill your horn, the symbol of strength, with oil and be on your way. I'm sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. I've chosen one of his sons to be king. Okay, so here, now we're in the story. Here's what he says next. But Samuel said, how can I go? Because if Saul, who's now a paranoid leader, hears about it, he'll kill me. That would be the enemy. And, and the Lord's like, look, don't, don't worry about that stuff. He's got an answer. He's like, look, take a heifer with you and, and say, I've come to actually sacrifice. I've come to just offer some worship to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you, Samuel, what to do. And you are to anoint for me the one that I indicate. And I love Samuel's response. Look what he does. He said, Samuel did what the Lord said. That's usually the way you win, okay? When he arrived at Bethlehem, the elders of the town trembled when they met him because it could have been bad news. Like, uh-oh, what's going on? They know things are a little tumultuous to Saul. Like, oh no, what's, kind of, what's happening here? They asked, do you come in peace? It's a fair question, fair question. Samuel replied, yep, look, just breathe, breathe, breathe. And that's it's kind of what's happening. Yeah, I'm coming in peace. I've come to sacrifice to the Lord. So consecrate yourself. Spend some time in prayer. Clean stuff. Like, just check your hearts here a little bit. And come 
to the sacrifice with me. We're going to worship together. Then he consecrated Jesse and his sons, and he invited them to the sacrifice as well. So they're there. Everybody's, it's kind of happening. So when they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab. He's the first, right, of one of the, the sons of Jesse and thought, man, surely this is it. God's anointed standing right here. I mean, look at this guy. But, but look, here's, Samuel's got thought, but then look what God says. Nope. Don't just consider his appearance or his height or his muscles or anything like that. Just, it, I, I've rejected him, meaning I simply can't bless him in the role of king. I haven't, I haven't rejected him as a human. I just can't bless him in the role of king. That's not what I created him to be. The Lord does not look at just things people look at. People look at the outward stuff and the appearance and how all that goes. But the Lord's actually looking first at the heart. So then Jesse starts calling other sons, right? And he had him pass in front. And Samuel said, no, that's not it. The Lord hasn't chosen this one. Jesse brings more. Okay, they just keep coming. And you keep getting this phrase, the Lord hasn't chosen this one either. And then look at this. <laughs> By the time we get to this, Jesse had seven of his sons passed before Samuel. And Samuel said, the Lord, he's not chosen any of these. Like, like, so he asked him a question. It's a really fair question, right? You got any more boys? Like, we've been here a while. You prayed at seven through, but you got any more? Like, you, is there anybody you're not telling us about? And he says, well, they're still the youngest, but he's just out tending sheep. That's what, that's what he, I mean, you don't really, need, like, that's just, he does that. Like, you don't really need to see him, right? He's doing the lowly job. Like, he's low on the totem pole, low in the family structure, low, like, that's, you're not literally looking for him, right? And Samuel, again, because Sam is just trusting God. Look what he says. Samuel said, go get that boy. Like, we want to see him too. In fact, this is so important. We're not going to sit down until he gets here, however long that takes, right? So Jesse does what Samuel says. He says, so he sent for him, and he had him brought in, and he's glowing with all this health and fine appearance. He's been out in the sun getting all his vitamin D while he's shepherded. I mean, he's looking good, right? He's ready. He's got fine appearance, and he's got handsome features, okay? And then look what the, look what the Lord says. The Lord says, hey, um, man, rise up. Like, come to attention. Come, I just want you to see it. Come to attention and anoint him. This is the one. This one, so Samuel does it. This is what Samuel does. He, he says, so Samuel took the, the horn and the oil, anointed him in the presence of his brothers, and from that down, the Spirit of the Lord was on David because he was in the role that God had created him to live, right? So, so he, could bless, he could bless that. Now, here, you're like, okay, now wait a second, but there's a king, and okay, he's anointing people, and what's that have to do with identity and everything else? Well, this early on in David's life, we get a window into what the ancient custom really was. Really, it was the predominant way, even up until just a few hundred years ago, right? Maybe four or five hundred years ago in our time, right? And the, the identity in this time, and it's still true some today, but identity in this time was largely formed externally which simply meant this. When an identity was formed externally, the culture and the community decide what is good, valuable, and worthy of honor and approval. When, when, when identity is formed externally, it's the people around you, it's the, it's the external influences, be it media, social media, friend groups, tribes of people, whatever else. It's all of that that's shaping the identity. You're learning from them. This, the, the, you're letting them establish this is what's valuable. This is what will give me recognition. This is where, I, if I do this, I get approval from them, and that brings value and stability to my life. It's external. The internal doesn't really matter in this culture. It's, it's what does the other people bring. So that's where you get customs that shape identity, patterns and habits and ways of working, ways of living, right? And the only way your identity is ever really anchored is if the people or tribes or group around you that you look to is if they give you that ultimate approval, if they give you that ultimate affirmation. And look, it's an ancient way that still has some expression in our culture. I mean, some of us today could really ask, is my worth primarily established, even if I've never consciously thought about it, by the people around me, the groups around me, the culture around me? Look, we, we're, most of us here, right, most of us, we, we are, live in, or at least some period of time, we have lived in West Michigan. Even West Michigan has a culture, right? It has a culture. And so does New York, and so does Seattle, and so does Indianapolis, and so does Kalamazoo, right? There's, there's a culture. And the question becomes, is, is that culture primarily shaping my identity? 
And if you've never thought about it, I would just like to suggest to you today the answer to that question of is the culture shaping your identity is yes, more than you think. Yes, more than you think. Doesn't mean it's all bad. Doesn't mean it's all good. It's just yes, more than you think. And so here's the, here's the beauty. There's the gift in that is, boy, it'd just be nice if people would paint the picture and I would know what it is and this is how, this is how I live this thing out. The, 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 here's the problem. When, when it's external, the challenge is that we're relying on people to set that. And people are kind of fickle and fairly flawed, right? I mean, can we just agree? They're kind of fickle and fairly flawed. I mean, you don't have to elbow the person next to you to tell them that's them. It's just true. It's, and it's okay. But, it's, it's, but that's one way. Let's talk about another way because there might even be a, a, maybe we'll bump into a, a combination of ways. There's another way. First Samuel chapter 11. So a little different pocket of, of David's life and of David's story. David is, he's not king. He's playing this thing out, right? And so let, let's check this thing out. It says this. In the spring, at the time when kings go off to war, you just got to hear that, like that's, but you just got to, you got to see it because here's the deal. Um, David's at a time, right, where he's like, hey, this is, this is the thing. I should be going off to war, but I think I've accomplished enough. I think I've proven enough. I think I've conquered enough that I'm not really going to do what it is would be the custom of the kings to do in the time. That's not really what I'm going to do. I'm going to kind of stay back. I probably deserve a chance to stay back. I deserve, I know this is what we all do, but I, I deserve a chance to stay back. And that I deserve a chance to stay back, it leads to some things, right? David sent Joab, and with the king's men, Joab was his leading warrior, kind of commander in chief. The whole Israelite army, they destroyed the Ammonites and they besieged Rabbah, but David remained in Jerusalem. See the writer, like, we got to get this in here twice. This is so significant that he stayed. And then there's a problem with what he stayed. One evening, David got up from his bed, and he walked around on the roof of the palace, and he can see everything, and he sees this woman bathing, kind of, he can see it from his rooftop, and that leads to another problem. The woman was very beautiful, and David sent someone to find out about her. The man said, oh, that's Bathsheba. She's the daughter of Eliam, and she's the wife of Uriah the Hittite, who's actually in David's army, okay? So things are getting more and more complex. David sent the messenger her, and she came to him, and he slept with her. Then she went back home, and the woman conceived and sent word to David saying, I'm pregnant. Now, we got a problem. We actually got a series of problems. Um, David, number one, is not married to Bathsheba. Uh, number two, now Bathsheba is pregnant. Number three, Uriah, her husband, is in David's army. Number four, if you read the rest of the story, David, in an attempt to cover it up, actually ends up getting Uriah murdered. Okay? It's a great king right now. I mean, right? It's a great moment in his history, apparently. Okay? So the, it's, there's, all of this, there's all of this negative momentum in David's life. Because he's so far outside of, of God's hand of blessing, the consequences like just keep piling up all of a sudden. And it all starts because David doesn't go to war. D David stays back when he should have gone to fight. And part of what's happening to David in the moment is David is no longer forming his identity externally. It's not more about what his dads think. It's no more what his brothers think, who his brothers discounted him at times. It's no more what Saul, the king, who tried to kill him, thought. It's not shaped by any of that external stuff in this moment. David's identity now is shaped internally. And you can't have an identity formed internally. And when you do that, here's it's the same thing, right? An identity formed internally, it's all the same thing. You, you get it's like, uh, this is what's good, this is what's valuable, but you determine that. You determine it. Instead of they determine it, you determine it. And this is much more common in the last, in, in our era, modern era, but, but think about that in the last four or five hundred years, okay, not, not just like the, the 2000s, okay? The last four or five hundred years, that's more the, the thought. Wait, the, the enlightenment or the truth is within me. I, 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 I am that. And so we begin to form the identity. Th this is who I am. I determine what's good, and I will do that. And that, that will determine my worth and my value and my security. Now, there's a tension in this because when we form the identity internally, and it's what, it's what so much of population is doing, and here's the reason there is so much conflict and so much division, because we've all formed the identity, but then we take the internally formed identity, and then we try and impose it on others externally, right? External identity is like you, I'm kind of letting other people impose it on me. Internal is I form it, and then I expect everybody else to accommodate me in that, or to be like me in that. 
It feels better because it's like, well, nobody knows me like me. And it feels better because I understand what I need. It feels, right? And again, there can be some good in it. But the risk is slippery because you remember those external people who are fickle and flawed? Well, we're one of them. So when we form the identity internally, do you know who formed it? A very fickle and flawed person. It's you and it's me. Right? And so there's this vulnerability and this slipperiness to it. How do we really get to determine that? Why, how do we determine what's good? And what if my good is different than your good? What if my valuable is different than your valuable? How do we reconcile? Because if you say that's your identity and I say that's mine, and yet we're looking for paths of agreement, we're looking for paths of togetherness, just it becomes a little bit challenging. But listen, listen, here's the thing. If you've never thought about where has my identity come from, it has come from some combination of these two. It's not, it's, it's not did it. It, it. it did. It did. It is. Right now in this moment, it is. It is, your identity is being shaped, has been shaped, will continue to be shaped. The question isn't, is it being shaped? It's how is it being shaped? How is my identity developing? Now, there, there's an alternative. We, we see this in David, too. We see it kind of in God's view of David and how it all plays out. First Samuel chapter 13, check this out. That's what God says. The Lord has sought a man. He's talking about David. After his own heart, whose heart just kind of wants to be with me and appointed him or her ruler of his people. Now, listen, here's the thing. Don't hear that and think, well, yeah, because David was great. I just told you a whole story where David was a train wreck, right? Does David do a lot of good things? He sure does. Is David really human? You know it. He's remarkably human. I mean, come on. He took somebody who wasn't his wife. He killed her. I mean, that's a mess. That is a mess, Right? And yeah, here's God, like, yeah, but David, he doesn't always get it right because he's fickle and flawed, but his heart is after me. Like, his heart generally is bent in my direction. And even David, after the whole Bathsheba and Uriah thing, has an incredible moment of repentance. When he's called on it, when he's confronted by it, it's like, oh, that, that's me. There's no denying, there's no blame game, it's just, that's me. That was me. And, and God's honoring that, and it's like, hey, look, I, I'd like to just say that's a heart that, that the end of the day is bent in my direction. And it's like, let me, let me shape that. I'll, I, can use, I can use that. You can have an identity that's formed externally by all of these other people, and, and sometimes maybe parts of it feel good, but they're fickle and flawed. And what do you do when they change their opinion or the target changes? What do you do when the culture swings quickly? And you don't necessarily agree, but yet that was your identity and culture was your identity, so you've somehow got to swing. And then you say, okay, well, let me go internal. I'll form it internally because I can't trust what my parents did or what other people did or what teachers did or what leaders did. I can't trust that. So I'll go internal. But then what happens when you want to also change something? What happens when you find the thing in you that isn't as reliable as you thought it once was? What happens in you when the crisis hits because your identity wasn't as settled as we thought it might have been? Well, there's all, there's, I mean, there's an alternative. There can be identity formed by God. This is, this is what David's experiencing. Where God gets to determine, man, this is good. Because God is good. The, the scriptures actually describe God as he is good. It's multiple things. One of them, he is just good. He determines what's valuable. Because he, he, he says that, that's valuable. He, he says what's worthy of honor and what's, what's worthy of approval. And he's already done so much of that, right? God, God established value and worth when he sent his son for you. I mean, that's like you're valuable enough that I'm doing that. You're worthy enough that I'm, that I'm doing that. It's like, so when, when God would determine this, and so that's what, that's what, when David, listen, when David is healthy and when David's decisions are good, listen, when David, for those of you who lead in any capacity, when David's leadership is at its finest, it's when his identity comes from here. That's what, right? When David's leadership gets wonky, weird, and in crisis, when David's family isn't functioning right, when it's when the identity primarily was being shaped by external people and forces and things, or when he was kind of determined in his own mind what he deserved and what he was worth. He's healthy. Things are moving in a good direction because it's so vital. This is such a significant vital sign. Everything else we do in the next few weeks, there's this anchoring point in this identity thing. So the question becomes, when Dave, like if, if an identity is formed by God, what, did that, what would that actually mean? What, what would that look like? Well, well, here's the thing. When our identity is formed by God, a couple of things happen. Number one, number one, he, he, 
He takes our performance and he lays his performance on top of it. He's like, you don't have to live your life based on your performance. That's why I sent my son. That's why Jesus, who in perfect form, took on death, took on your sin, took on your brokenness. And he, he just, he imposes that over. It says, look, if you'll receive me, here's the thing. Because of me, not because of you, I'm determining that you are holy and you are good and you are blameless. You would have never been able to do anything on, to earn that yourself, but I'm giving you that. And what God does in that, he's like, look, because you're, because you're really made in my image, I'm restoring you to that. He'll never give you an identity. He'll never, listen, he'll never give you an identity that's in contradiction to who he is. It's always going to be based on who he is. Let me give you one almost humorous example. Uh, Eric and I were reading a book together last week, maybe the last 10 days or so. Um, and it's written by this, this guy who uh, kind of talks about uh, being a Christian. He even, it's, it's really odd, like he even talks inside of this book, like um, how he, he uh, gives more than anybody else in his church or whatever. And it's written to a secular market. It's not even in church. So there's all these things that kind of make you just have this like moment of cringe just multiple times, right? And one of the things he talks about in the book is uh, multiple times, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian. But then multiple times he'll talk about just destroying people who get in his way. I just run people over. I'm a destroyer. If they're in my way of the dream, I'm just running them over. I'm like, huh. Like, and we, we at times have like cringed and grieved and every time just laughed talking about it because that's so far contradictory to who God has created you to be. God, I just tell you, God has not made you to be a destroyer of people. Some of us have adopted that mantle, unfortunately, in the last couple of years, but we'll talk about that another time. But the, the reality, it's like God didn't make us to be that, right? It's almost humorous to read it and to see it. But, but God, because God says, look, I'm not, if you'll just receive me and let me be the giver of your identity, I'm going to be holy, holy and blameless. The other thing he does, I'm, he says, I'm just going to give you the identity of being a person that's loved and accepted. I just love and accept you. Before you do anything to earn it, before you have to manufacture it internally, I'm just going to give it to you. David, even all his faults and failures and everything else, there's times where he writes in the Psalms about God just lifting his head like so he could see face to face God, just see God's affection, God being everything he needs. Psalm 23 is so much written out of David's identity being shaped by God, being formed by God, not other things, not what he had conquered, not other nations, not the people who served him, not his family, just God. When God gives us our identity, he always restores us to his originally divine purpose for us. God wanted David to be king. God created David to be a king. God created you to be something, do something, live in a way, right? And God's always restoring that. Now, the ultimate example, right, obviously, I mean, I wanted to do David because he's got all these blemishes, right? I mean, I just, I, again, I like that guys like David are in the Bible, right? But the ultimate example, obviously, is Jesus, right? I mean, this identity, Jesus, where is Jesus' identity come from? I mean, Jesus had a lot of external people who were for him, right? That, that could have been something. He also had a lot of people that were against him, could have shaped it. I mean, Jesus did like crazy amounts of miracles. He was a really good teacher. Everybody crowding in to hear him. You can see how internally Jesus could have just formed a really strong identity of himself, right? I seem to be really good at this, right? But it's really formed, it's really formed by his father. Do you catch it in one verse, Matthew chapter 3, verse 17, Jesus' baptism. And when Jesus comes back up out of the water, there's this voice from heaven. It's God, his father, saying, hey, this is my dearly loved son. Here are a couple things there, acceptance and all sorts of affection. All sorts of affection. And he brings me great joy. I'm really pleased with him. There's all sorts of approval. God said, God, I just approve you. Jesus, I approve you. God the Father just said, Jesus, I approve you. I got all sorts of acceptance of you. You're going to be my son. I just got all sorts of affection for you. I love you so much, and I'm so proud of you. I'm just so proud of you. And, and he's, he's, this is the identity. And then Jesus lives out of that. Everything Jesus does, Jesus does knowing, oh, I already have the approval of my Father. That's why he multiple times says, I can't do anything that the Father doesn't invite me to do. Because I just, I love his approval, and that's, that's where my approval comes from, is his approval of me, like I'm good. And we spend lots of our life, again, almost without thinking about it, working for, striving for, building something to establish some sense of significance, approval, worth, value, security, stability. And some of it's really good, but none of it's strong enough to carry the weight of your identity. Nothing strong enough to weather every single storm that's coming. 
there's, there's, just a, there's a more freeing way to live this thing. There's, a, there's just a less pressure sort of way. There's a less burden sort of way. There's a more resilient sort of way. Let me just, let me just tell you what it is. Here, here's the thing. When, when God determines our identity, we get to live from approval and not for approval. When God determines our identity, we get to live like this person already approved. Listen, when, when we surrender ourselves to Jesus and his goodness, and, and he says, look, you may not be perfect in conduct, but you have my approval. I, I just, I want you. I choose you. I'm for you. I'm with you. We get to live from his approval. So the next pressure-packed decision you are trying to make, and it might really carry some pressure, it might be a really big decision, you are making that from the position of a person that's already approved, not trying to get ultimate approval. The next thing you do with God, the next prayer you pray, is from already being approved, not trying to get his approval. The next crisis you navigate when you're longing for God's engagement, you're doing it from approval, not trying to get or keep his approval. So here's part of the reality is that that human relationships are a wonderful gift. They're beautiful. We're made to be in relationship. But again, because we are all fickle and flawed, sometimes they break. Sometimes they don't go perfectly. And when we do, and there's this sense of rejection, when there's this sense of of separation, if our identity is fully banked on that external piece, we're in trouble. Because while other people's approval matters, and it's, it's, it's meaningful, and it's helpful... We, live, we can live from a place of already being approved, already, already being, just, just it being settled. Every now and then, we got to ask. We just, we got to put the blood pressure cuff on. We got to put the oxygen reader on. We got to check the temperature. We got to, how is our identity being formed? And would we accept the gift of living from this place, God shaping the identity so that we're, we get to live from approval, not for it. And it's okay to acknowledge that we live from approval and and sometimes slide back into this, I'm trying to get approval. That's why, that's why it's a vital sign. That's why we got to check it periodically. So we got to understand like the ways it could be formed and where is ours really at. So what I want to leave you with today is I just want to leave you a little bit with what your identity is or can be. Just markers of your identity in Jesus. Like as a person approved by God, just markers of your identity. These, these are true and we could choose to embrace them. Here, let me just give you a handful of them. Here's, here's the first one. Just let me, let me play them out here for you. You could just say this about true. I'm significant. You're, you're significant. You're already significant. Look, before you do another thing that's worth anything, you're significant. Before you make another dollar, before you lead something else, before you parent in a certain way, before you raise a certain kind of kid, before you whatever, before you buy another toy, before you have another experience, you are significant. You are right now in this moment significant. Your life means something. And it doesn't mean anything because of what everybody else says or does or what you manufacture. That means something because God has already determined your value and worth. Connected to that is that you're chosen. You can just say, I'm, I'm chosen. I, I, I am picked. I, I, I was chosen by God before I chose God. And God wanted me before I wanted him. I'm seen. I am seen. Look, you're, you're, you just, I'm I'm seen. In worlds of crowds but separation, I am seen. In big families and fun events but isolation, I'm seen. I love this one. You know this big one for me. I I got a purpose. You got a purpose. You You may not feel it, but you got a purpose. And I don't care if you're eight or in your 80s. You got a purpose. You, You got a heartbeat and a passion and a something that you were created to live. You got a purpose. That's always going to be true. 
How about this one? I, I am persevering. And some of us don't feel that right now. Like we feel more tired than we do persevering. But there is a spirit of perseverance. And God says, look, you got that. That's part of who you are with me. I've been born of God. You said, I, I've, I've been born of God. And the evil one cannot touch me. I, the, you want to talk about a securing mark to your identity? I've been born of God. And the evil one cannot touch me. Which doesn't mean nothing bad ever happens. We all got enough life experience to know lots of bad things happen. What it means is that even when bad happens, the evil one cannot touch my identity. Even when bad happens, I am still approved. I am still chosen. I am still wanted. I am still seen. The bad, I mean, junk happens. It does happen. Lots of you are in it right now. But, that, but when the identity is settled and formed by God, it cannot be touched. Cannot be touched. It is unshakable. These, these are just a few, right? We, we could make dozens. This, this is a few, all of them from the story of God and Scripture. So here's what I want to invite you to do. I want to invite you to stand. If you're here in the room, just, just stand with me. If, if you're joining from online, if you want to stand, that's great. Whatever's going to kind of give you the, the best mode here to engage a little bit. But I often finish with a blessing. I'm going to do that. But what I want to do just to kind of seal this time up is I want to invite us just to read these together, okay? So maybe you're not convinced they're true about you, I just, just read it anyway. Just like, just read it anyway. Form to the pressure of your identity being externally, for, never mind. Don't do that. But, okay, but just like, just, just read it, just let it soak in a little bit. Let it soak in. We'll read these together. Here we go. Let's start. Here we go. I am significant. I am chosen. I am seen. I have a purpose. I am persevering. I've been born of God. And have an evil one cannot touch me. The Holy Spirit, would you seal that in us? Would you give us the, the wisdom and discernment to see all of the influences trying to shape our primary identity? And would you help us be at home and how you form it? Just help us be at home there. Help us be at home with the freedom to live from your approval with statements like this. Seal that in us, I pray, and then send us in to the days and the opportunities that are in front of us to be the witness you said we would be in Jesus' name. Amen, everybody? Amen. Amen. Hey, check your pulse on that this week. Come on back. We're going to keep on going next week. We'll see you in a friend then. See you.